Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and throughout this lecture series, we're going to cover essentially everything you need to know relating to pharmacology for nurses. Whether you're here as part of your nursing school, as part of getting ready for the NCLEX, getting ready for nurse practitioner school, or just wanting to refresh on pharmacology, I hope you find this series helpful. The lecture notes that we are using are available to be downloaded off of our website, and it's recommended that you get those and follow along as we go through. Today, we're gonna to be talking about infectious disease. This is one of the largest classes or groups of medications, and there's so much to know about it. Plus, this is one of the most commonly used medications in the United States when we think about all the antibiotics that are given. Let's begin with talking about a few key concepts. We're gonna start with antibacterial concepts, and I wanna be clear with the very first point. Antibacterial or antibiotic means against bacteria. And in terms of pharmacology, that's very specific. That's not the same as antiviral or antifungal or antiprotozoal. If something is against bacteria, it is only against bacteria. Two definitions that you should be familiar with are bacteriostatic and bactericidal. Bacteriostatic is something that inhibits growth of bacteria, whereas bactericidal kills off bacteria. I wouldn't expect you to have to know it any more in depth than that, but just be familiar with those two definitions. Bacteria have long been subdivided into two groups, gram-positive and gram-negative, and there are some outliers as well. Some examples of gram-positive would be Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pneumonia. Some gram-negative examples would be E. coli, H. influenza, Helicobacter pylori, and so on. Depending on your program and what you're going for, you may or may not need to know some of the prominent examples of each of these gram-positive and gram-negative, but you should definitely be familiar with that. This is a way that we divide different bacteria into two groups. DOT, or direct observation therapy, is when we give a medication to a patient and they take the medication right in front of the healthcare provider. And this is done to ensure compliance with the medication, specifically when we're dealing with communicable infectious diseases. Antimicrobial stewardship is a group of principles that was put together by many of the global health organizations to combat the issue of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is becoming a larger and larger issue, and it's been recognized as one for over a decade now. And it's where the more we give patients antibiotics, the more likely we are to develop pathogens or to see evolved pathogens that are resistant to the medications that we have. And this can in the future be a really big problem because if we do have a pathogen that we have no medication to eradicate it, it has free range to infect people. And if it's a fatal disease, it would kill everyone off. So we need to make sure that we are addressing the issue of antibiotic resistance. And to that end, the health organizations have developed antimicrobial stewardship. So what is antimicrobial stewardship? Well, it's a group of principles that we have to ensure that we are managing our antibiotics correctly. Some of these apply at the provider level, some of these apply at the RN level. Let's begin with at the provider level. First and foremost, we only give a medication when it's needed, specifically an antibiotic. What do I mean by that? The classic example is a patient that comes in with rhinovirus, also known as the common cold. These patients do not need an antibiotic. It is not going to help them. It's not gonna treat their condition. They have a virus, an antibiotic is for bacteria. However, many people, even today, want that antibiotic. It is uh, incumbent upon both the provider and the RN to educate the patient on their condition and on the fact that an antibiotic is not necessary for what they have. When we do give an antibiotic, and this is at the provider level, we wanna make sure we're giving the correct antibiotic. So if they have a uh, skin infection of the foot, I'm not giving them an antibiotic that's used for ear infections. We want to make sure that we are giving them the correct antibiotic for what they have. We also want to make sure that we're using targeted antibiotics when possible. We talked about this in the very first lecture because this applies universally to medications, but now we're talking about it specifically for antibiotics. The classic example here is if a patient has a UTI, I can give a patient an antibiotic that just targets the bacteria in the urinary tract versus I could give them a very powerful antibiotic that kills off all the bacteria but that's not gonna be helpful to the patient. Next, we have something called C. difficile. 
C. difficile is an infection and it is most common in patients that have, are taking certain antibiotics. As far as nurses go, we want to make sure to educate patients to look out for signs of diarrhea. That's the classic sign of C. diff. And that's something that we would be concerned about as an adverse effect of many of the different antibiotics, especially the broad spectrum and powerful ones. I don't wanna skip a few things that nurses can do to address antibiotic, antimicrobial stewardship. And that would be things like advocating for your patient to get a doctor's note so that we can prevent transmission of these infections to other people. So that would be something you would ask them, do you need a note for work or school? Let me go get you one to make sure that you're sick, but you don't go and make other people sick as well. You also wanna educate patients to take their medication exactly as prescribed, don't share it with anyone else. You wanna educate your patients to take their medication for the full length that it was prescribed. Next, antibiotics can also cause yeast infections. That's another thing, especially for testing purposes. What would you educate your patient to look out for when taking certain antibiotics? It would be to look out for and report signs of a yeast infection because that is a known adverse effects, just like C. diff, of taking certain antibiotics. We're right now talking about antibiotics, but in this lecture, we're gonna cover all the different pathogens. So let's go through what they are. They are bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, worms, and prions. Prions we're not gonna talk about. We don't have any medications that we're gonna discuss designed to fight prion pathogens, but we are gonna go through medications for all of the rest. And right now we're starting with bacteria. Finally, before we get into specific medications, I do wanna tell you that as we go through infectious disease, all of these medications are designed to kill off the pathogen that's making you sick, but that takes time. So in the meantime, we do wanna educate patients to manage their symptoms with other medications, depending what it is. If it's some of the more common things, something like ibuprofen or acetaminophen would be the correct answer. But again, fair game for a test, what would be an additional recommendation for your patient who's newly prescribed with strep throat? Taking an over-the-counter pain medication would be correct. So the first class of antibiotics we're going to be talking about are penicillins. Penicillins have been around for a very long time. They were very famously discovered by Axonet, and it includes a whole bunch of medications, amoxicillin, ampicillin, PenG, PenB, and many more. The mechanism of action for penicillins is that they disrupt bacteria cell wall synthesis. Humans do not have cell walls, so a medication that destroys cell walls is very good at targeting bacteria without hurting um, any of our cells. Some of the things that these medications are used for are strep throat, otitis media, which is an ear infection, syphilis, and many, many more. I would not expect you at an RN level to have to know which specific diseases are used for which specific antibiotic that is probably well beyond what nurses or the NCLEX would test on. However, I do list them here just that you have some idea as you get into your practice so that you get to know what to be familiar with. Penicillins and a few other classes of antibiotics are referred to sometimes as beta-lactam antibiotics, and that's simply related to the structure, the way that specific antibiotic works. That's not something that you would need to um, pay that much attention to, but if you come across that term beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillins are one of them. Adverse effects, GI upsets, probably the most common. And to combat that, we do educate patients to take their medication with food. Keep in mind, that is a legitimate question. What would a patient be educated to do to avoid the effects of GI upset or just in general to avoid the adverse effects? Do keep in mind throughout pharmacology, we do do that sometimes where we tell the patient to take their medication with food to avoid adverse effects. That only applies to PO medications. If I'm giving you an IM medication that causes GI upset, Generally speaking, taking it with food is not gonna help. These medications also prolong bleeding time, especially when mixed with other uh, medications that are meant to prolong bleeding time, such as warfarin. We'll talk more about that when we get to anticoagulation lecture. Penicillins are the most common drug allergy in all of pharmacology. Please know as a nurse, you must ask your patient what is their um, response to taking a medication. We don't want just patients telling us, oh, I'm allergic, Tell me what happens, because there's a big difference between, oh, I got a little bit of a rash versus I stopped breathing. And whatever it is, we want to go ahead and document that. The next class of drugs we're going to talk about is cephalosporins, which we're not up to yet, but I do want to mention this one point. Cephalosporins are structurally very, very similar to penicillin. So if a patient's allergic to penicillin, they might be allergic to cephalosporin as well. However, 
they are similar, but they are not the same. So generally speaking, if someone has an allergy to penicillin, they have a slightly increased allergy compared to anyone else of also being allergic to cephalosporin. Whether or not we would still use that cephalosporin depends on how allergic they are to that penicillin. Again, whether it was that little rash, whether it was full-blown anaphylaxis or something in between. But just so you know, um, for testing purposes, for NCLEX purposes, if a patient's allergic to, cephalo to penicillins, they have a slightly higher chance than the general public of also being allergic to cephalosporin. That does not mean they are also allergic to cephalosporins. Keep in mind the general rule of thumb that we talked about in, week, in the very first lecture is that if a patient is allergic to one drug in a class, we assume they're allergic to all of the drugs in the class. So let's talk a little bit about how these medications work, because this is definitely fair game, even at the RN level. So these drugs work by using beta-lactam. So beta-lactam is what goes out and fights that pathogen. Some bacteria have become smart. They've mutated, and they develop shields to protect them from beta-lactam. Think of beta-lactam, that's what's in your amoxicillin. Think of that as a weapon that goes out and kills the bacteria but the bacteria have developed a shield and that shield is called beta-lactam ACE. ACE meaning it's an enzyme and this enzyme breaks down the beta-lactam. So it breaks down that weapon that we sent at the bacteria. So now we sent the weapon at the bacteria, the bacteria has this shield that broke down our weapon. So now the bacteria is still in charge, it's still in command, it's still able to keep making us sick. So we do have something that was developed that's called beta-lactam ACE inhibitors. So we have beta-lactam drugs like penicillin, bacteria have beta-lactam ACE, that's the shield to defend against it. And then we have beta-lactam ACE inhibitors. Now beta-lactam ACE inhibitors take down that shield. They take down beta-lactam ACE so that beta-lactam can still go and kill off the bacteria. So one more time, hope that didn't confuse you. Beta-lactam is the weapon that these medications have. Beta-lactam ACE is a shield that bacteria use to break down that antibiotic, but we can give the beta-lactam along with a beta-lactam ACE inhibitor to take down that shield so that the beta-lactam could go in and fight off the bacteria as was originally designed. Beta-lactam ACE just takes down the shield, or I'm sorry, beta-lactam ACE inhibitors just take down the shield of beta-lactam ACE. They themselves do not do any of the fighting with the pathogen. We still need to give them an antibiotic. The classic example of this would be Augmentin. Augmentin is a medication, it's two ingredients. It's amoxicillin with clavulonic acid. There are three beta-lactamase inhibitors, tazobactam, sulbactam, and clavulonic acid. When we take any of those along with an amoxicillin, now we have the weapon and now we have the means to take down their shield. So even if they have that shield, that beta-lactamase, we can still go forth and kill off that pathogen. Um, uh, and, uh, penicillin specifically are known to cause a rash when given to patients that have EBV, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, also known as mono. When patients develop mono, which has very similar symptoms to strep throat. Strep throat is a bacterial pathogen and it is treated with penicillin. However, mono and strep throat sometimes present similarly. If the wrong diagnosis is made and the patient's thought to have strep throat, which is a bacteria, but they really have EBV, mono, which is a virus, the bacteria, the amoxicillin is not gonna help them. However, there is something called a mono rash that patients sometimes get if we give them amoxicillin mistakenly for their mono, thinking that they have strep throat. Just something I'm throwing out there, I can't imagine that would be on an RN level test, but just something to know that patients Sometimes uh, may come in, mono and strep do have overlapping presentation. If the wrong diagnosis is made, the patient may be given the wrong medication and may have this adverse effect. The next drug class we're gonna talk about are cephalosporins. But before we do, since you're still here watching and hopefully enjoying and learning from this lecture, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. This content is all offered as a free resources um, for nurses, nursing students, and nurse practitioners. This channel is supported simply by you hitting the subscribe button and enjoying these videos. So moving on to cephalosporins, this is actually one of the largest classes of antibiotics and it is subdivided into five generations. So we have first gen, second gen, third gen, and so on of cephalosporins. 
Some examples that are listed here are cefazolin, ceftriaxone, and cefepime. There's more than 20 of them throughout all five generations. Ceftriaxone with cefin might be the one you're most familiar with. It's relatively common today, especially in the emergency setting. So the mechanism of action here is the exact same as penicillins. Remember we said these are very similar. It disrupts bacteria cell wall synthesis. Um, what are some things that these are used for? They're used for CAP, that's community acquired pneumonia. And we'll talk more about that when we get to pulmonology. It's used for meningitis, STIs, and others. Again, I would not expect you at the RN level to have to match up what antibiotic is for what pathogen. Just know, definitely know what's an antibiotic, what drug class it is, how it works, and patient education. Um, adverse effects here, there's a few of them, the same GI upset, and this one can also cause gallstones or kidney stones. We already discussed that if the patient's allergic to penicillin, be a little bit careful when using this in a patient um, that has that allergy. Next, we have carbapenems. The drugs here are imipenem or feralpenem, and the mechanism of action is still the same, disruption of cell wall synthesis. This medication is not susceptible to beta-lactamase like the penicillins were and some other drugs are. Um, the big thing about carbapenems that I would know for testing purposes is that they are administered parenterally only. This is not a PO medication. This is given parenterally. Next, we have the glycopeptides, and the one here that we're going to talk about is vancomycin. Again, still works by the same thing, disruption of bacterial cell wall synthesis. In this case, I will tell you, I would consider it fair game at the RN level to test you on what vancomycin is used for, because it is very famously used as the first-line agent for MRSA. MRSA is methicillin-resistant um, bacteria pathogen, but it is not uh, resistant to vancomycin, so it is considered the first-line drug for this treatment. We use it for other things as well. It does have two big adverse effects, nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. I would definitely know that. And then we also have something called uh, a problem that can develop if we give the medication too quickly. If you have an older textbook, this is sometimes referred to as red man syndrome, where the patient has high heart rate, flushing, and low blood pressure. And this can happen when vancomycin is given too fast. This does not mean they're allergic. It just means you got to slow down the rate. This does have a black box warning that it's teratogenic. It cannot be given in pregnancy. Again, all of these things, try to picture it of how the NCLEX would ask it. If it's something like nephrotoxicity, you can have a question on there, which of the following would be a... Uh, would give you cause for consideration before giving this medication. If they have chronic kidney disease or a dialysis patient, that would be a good answer. Uh, what would be an ongoing assessment for a patient taking this medication? Well, it causes ototoxicity. So baseline hearing test would be appropriate or an HCG test because it's teratogenic, things like that. Again, always try to think of how next gen is going to ask it. Next, we have astreonam. This is not a very commonly used drug. This is available both in the IV form. It's also available inhaled, not as an antibiotic, but to treat cystic fibrosis. And that's about as much of, about this drug that I would expect you to have to know. It is used for certain severe infections in the hospital setting, and it's also used inhaled to treat cystic fibrosis. Now we finish with the bacteria cell wall synthesis mechanism of action drugs, because all the ones we covered so far, the glycopeptides, the cephalosporins, those all work by inhibiting or disrupting bacteria cell wall sy synthesis. Now we're moving on to other forms of mechanism of action. The next one we're going to talk about are the tetracyclines, and the drugs here are tetracycline or doxycycline, two very commonly used medications. Mechanism of action here, these interrupt protein synthesis relating to bacteria. What do we use this for? We use these uh, doxy, especially we use it for a lot of different things. We actually use it for acne, chlamydia, and plenty of other infections. Two big things that I would definitely make sure I know and I would expect to see on a test discoloration of teeth that are still developing. So this would be something that you wouldn't want to give to children who do not have yet their permanent teeth fully developed. Also, it can cause photosensitivity where a patient's skin has increased sensitivity to UV light. So what would a patient education point for someone die, uh, being prescribed doxycycline? Something like um, keep away from children would be a correct education or Something like make sure you're wearing layers or at least proper clothing, long sleeve, long pants when going out in the sun. Again, that would be proper education for this. Unlike most other antibiotics, tetracycline should be taken on an empty stomach because that is a unique factoid here. I would know that because that's definitely your game for the test. Next drug class we have, still the same mechanism of action. It interrupts protein synthesis. 
and that's going to be the macrolide. This is some of the most commonly used medications, and the medications here are azithromycin or erythromycin, and these are used for so many different infections, chlamydia, pertussis, uh, that's whooping cough, diphtheria, and so much else. These are also generally our go-to um, antibiotic for patients that are allergic to penicillins. So if someone comes in with strep throat or an ear infection, both of which are treated with penicillins, we would very often, if they're allergic to penicillins, go to azithromycin, much more commonly known as z -Pak. It's a five-day course. It's simple. It's easy. We use that all the time. The big adverse effects of this medication are, again, the GI upsets, so take it with food. It causes angioedema, that's facial swelling. Again, know that because the test question would be, what would be a concerning sign of an adverse effect relating to um, azithromycin administration and swelling of the lips or something like that would be a correct answer. And hepatotoxicity, so again, that means caution in patients that have elevated AST, ALT, hepatitis, uh, alcohol use disorder, et cetera. The next drug class we have are the oxazolidinoids. Hopefully I said that right. One of the drugs here is linazolid. And again, this works by inhibiting protein synthesis. Now this drug class is almost exclusively reserved for resistant infections. We do not use this for any run of the mill infections as of today. And again, this recording uh, hopefully is up to date as of um, today. And right now we're towards the middle of 2023. When we talk about these antibiotic medications, we have this drug class sort of reserved for resistant infections. And right now, that would be MRSA, <coughs> excuse me, VRE, vancomycin resistant. So we have it saved for our resistant medication. Does it work for other things? Absolutely. But where we have other things available, we generally stay away from this and we save this for the resistant infections. The next drug class we have are aminoglycosides. And this would be something like gentamicin or cobramycin. These medications, again, work on disrupting bacteria protein synthesis. So, so far, we've had two mechanisms of action. The first bunch were inhibiting bacteria cell wall synthesis, and now we've had a whole bunch that uh, disrupt protein synthesis of bacteria. What do we use aminoglycosides for? We generally use it for severe gram-negative infection. These are almost never a first-line drug, with almost no exceptions. These are almost always an alternative or a backup option when we don't have another good option of what to give this patient. These medications are almost always given parenterally. They do have black box warnings for nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity, and they are teratogenic. They cannot be given in pregnancy. The next drug class we have are the fluoroquinolones, and the rest of the antibiotics we're gonna go through have a whole bunch of different mechanisms of action. At this point, I wouldn't expect, certainly not at the RN level, for you to have to match up a drug or a drug class with the mechanism of action of these remaining ones. So going through the fluoroquinolones, also known as quinolones, we have ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, and a whole bunch of others. This works by interfering with bacteria DNA. What do we use this for? Well, we use this for a lot of different things. We use it for UTIs, we use it for, use it for HAP, which is hospital-acquired pneumonia. Remember earlier we saw CAP, which is community-acquired pneumonia. These medications do have a black box warning for tendonitis and tendon rupture. So again, make sure you educate your patient on the signs and symptoms to look out for. And again, because of that, primarily, this medication is rarely a first choice. However, the quinolones are effective against a very large amount of pathogens, whether it's GI pathogens, respiratory pathogens, it is effective against a whole lot. So we do use it a whole lot. It's just not ideal because of the adverse effects that it causes. One thing I do want to point out, because this is interesting, so you may see this on a test, is this medication is very well known that it's used for a lot of WMD attacks, a lot of biological attacks such as the plague, such as anthrax and others, we oftentimes use it for that. So again, we oftentimes use it for, weapon, uh, for biological attacks to treat patients that have that, or prophylactically in patients that were exposed to a lot of deadly diseases such as anthrax. The next drug class we have are the sulfonamides. And the main one that we use today is Bactrim. Bactrim or Bactrim DS, which is Bactrim double strength. Bactrim or Bactrim DS is more commonly known, at least the generic name would be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And you definitely get extra points if you can properly say that. Usually people just say TMP SMX. This medication works in a few different ways. And again, I wouldn't expect you to have to know that. What do we use this for? We actually use it for a lot of different things. We use it for UTIs, we use it for uh, PCP pneumonia, 
We use it for GI infections and a whole bunch else. The adverse effects for this one are rhabdomyolysis. And again, depending on whether or not you've already learned about rhabdo, you have to know what are the signs and symptoms of it because that is fair game for a test. So rhabdo, you would look out for things like muscle breakdown or muscle pain or a dark tinge to the urine or bleeding in the urine, all of those type of things. Other adverse effects are SLE, which stands for systemic lupus erythematous, which is lupus or crystal urea. This medication, TMPSMX, is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy, just like vancomycin was the other one that we said is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy, as well as the aminoglycosides. Next medication that we have for antibiotic, and this is the last antibiotic we're going to talk about, is nitrofurantoin, more commonly known under the brand name Macrobid. And again, the mechanism of action, I wouldn't expect you to have to know it, but it is that it damages the DNA of the bacteria. We use this for one thing lower UTIs. And I say lower UTIs, a UTI is generally, when we talk about it, we talk about it, that it is lower. We do have other options for UTIs, such as uh, fluoroquinolone, Cipro, we have Augmentin, we have TMPSMX, all of those can be used for a UTI, but this is the preferred one. The reason why is because this is very targeted. This only targets the bacteria in the lower uh, urinary tract. So it's really good at killing off what we want, are preserving and not affecting anything else. However, UTIs can become upper uh, tract infections, aka kidney infection or pyelonephritis. If the patient progressed to that point, this medication would no longer be effective. We do have a CAM that some patients and some textbooks are going to recommend for patients that want to prevent developing UTIs, and that is cranberry juice. I want to be clear on this. Most textbooks are generally considered that Cranberry juice helps prevent UTIs, not treat UTIs. Treating UTIs is something else. That is not done with cranberry juice. So we've come to the end of most of the bacteria that we're going to be talking about. So let's talk about a little bit of a different type of, of pathogen, and that's tuberculosis. To start, tuberculosis is sometimes tested for, as most of you watching is probably familiar with, a TB skin test. And that is also known as a PPD or a TST. TST is tuberculosis and skin test. PPD is uh, purified protein derivative. Both of these mean the same thing. Both of them are a TB skin test. Let's do two seconds talking about that. A TB skin test is where we place a tiny um, bit of this uh, solution under the skin. And the technical term for where we're administering it is intradermal, into the skin. Okay, not transdermal. We had that as a different route but intradermal, and this is one of the only times we ever use intradermal, and we're just putting it just below the surface of the skin. And what are we looking out for? We're looking to see if the body recognizes the markers on this fluid that we administered it. We're just putting one ML, one CC, or I'm sorry, 0.1 ML or 0.1 CC under this patient's skin, and we're looking to see if the body recognizes it. If the body doesn't recognize it because you've never been exposed to TB, the body's gonna just absorb it like any other fluid, it's gonna go away. But if the body does recognize it, it's gonna send, it's gonna react, it's gonna respond. It's gonna send white blood cells and other things to that area to fight it off. In that case, that one little 0.1 ml that we put under the patient's skin is gonna become hard. It's gonna stay there for a little bit, it's gonna become hard. So if it becomes hard, that is what we're looking for. That's a positive TB skin test. Now there are more details on that, depending on how the deep, how big the hardness is, the induration is what we call it, how big that is, whether it's five millimeters, 10 millimeters, or 15 millimeters, depends on whether it's diagnostic or not. I'm not going to get into all of that in this lecture. So that's a common test that we use for TB. So let's talk about medication for TB. First of all, I want to let you know, as healthcare providers, you may at some point in your career have to take these medications prophylactically. Prophylactic means before you get sick, and in this case, it's considered post-exposure prophylactically after you were exposed, but before you got sick. The primary two medications that we have for TB are rifampin and isoniazide or INH. So let's talk about each of these. Rifampin and INH, again, I wouldn't expect you to have to know the mechanism of actions here, but they're used for both the treatment and the prevention of TB. And rifampin is also used for meningi meningiococcal prophylaxis. It is also used off-label for other things. Both of these medications, are hepatotoxic, so you have to check the patient's liver. Rifampin, very important, and Tess love to ask about this, 
It can change the color of your bodily fluids, such as your urine or your tears. It can change them to a reddish orange. That's definitely something you need to educate your patient about because if you didn't give them a heads up on that, they are going to freak out when that happens and come running back to your clinic or ER. So you have to make sure to educate the patient on that. I and H, again, same thing. We're lumping these two together because they're almost always given together. I do want to point out when a patient is uh, diagnosed with TB, it's a four drug cocktail. They get rifampin, they get I and H, they get pyrazidamide, and they get ethambutol. They get all four of these medications. The acronym for this is RIPE, R-I-P-E, rifampin, I and H, pyrazidamide, and ethambutol. However, when a patient is exposed to TB, but taking this medication prophylactically when they're not actually diagnosed with it, in that case, we usually just use the first two, the rifampin and the INH. One other thing I want to point out, the treatment for these goes on for many months. Depending on whether it's prophylactically or you're actually diagnosed with TB, you're going to be taking these medications for many months. So do know that because that is fair game on a test. Now let's move on to fungi. So we finished with bacteria. Now let's talk about fungi infections. So the first class of drugs we're going to have here are the azole antifungals commonly also known as just the azoles. And this is gonna be fluconazole or ketoconazole. These work by interfering with specific functions related to the fungi's development and uh, life cycle processing. Again, I wouldn't expect you to have to know that. I would expect you to know that this drug is gonna be used for a fungal infection such as candidiasis, and it's not gonna be used for a bacterial infection such as strep pneumonia. Adverse effects, they have quite a few of them. We have cardiac and blood effects. So again, keep an eye on the patient's uh, vitals, possibly monitor an ECG and uh, monitor a CBC for those blood effects. SJS and 10, we've seen this quite a bit already and we're gonna see it a whole bunch in this lecture, especially in the second half of it as we're in now, that this is dermatologic condition. So we're gonna have the patient immediately report any adverse skin effects or ad adverse um, skin symptoms. SJS and 10 stands for Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. This drug is, these drugs are also hepatotoxic, so we'd want to monitor the liver as well, look out for things like jaundice, um, AST, ALT that's elevated, things like that. Ketoconazole and myconazole are two azo antifungals that are available over the counter in several different formulations to treat different fungal infections. Also, high dose ketoconazole is sometimes used for Cushing disease, so you are going to see us discuss that drug again when we get to endocrine. The next drug class, class we have are polyalines. Hopefully I said that correctly. The drug name here is amphotericin. This is a really powerful drug and it's just used for severe systemic fungal infections. Uh, adverse effects of this drug is nephrotoxicity and hematologic effects. Many patients who receive this medication also develop what's called an infusion reaction. That's fever, chills, nausea, and headache. And you do need to know that because you need to understand that's not an allergy. It's an infusion reaction to different things. This medication has a black box warning that because of the massive amount of adverse effects that this medication can cause, it should only be used for severe systemic fungal infections. Another drug that we have here for fungal infections is Nystatin. And this is available topically um, and as an oral suspension. When it's given for an oral suspension, for example, for oral candidiasis, the directions to the patient will be put it in your mouth, swish it, and then either swallow it or spit it out. However, if the patient has the candidiasis, the fungal infection, the back of the throat, you also need to educate the patient to gargle with the medication, again, to expose the back of the throat to this medication. Really important patient education points for this medication. Definitely fear game for your test, uh, NCLEX or nurse practitioner on how to take a medic, uh, antifungal medication when you're talking about candidiasis of the throat. Also keep in mind, these medications are generally safe to swallow unless told otherwise. So we're gonna have the patient swish it around, gargle if needed, and then they can even swallow so that we get that last little bit of the throat is exposed to the medication as it goes down. The next drug class we have are the antivirals. And now we're moving on to viruses. So, so far we covered bacteria and so far we covered fungi. Now we're moving on to viruses. The drug class antivirals has a whole bunch. And sometimes these are subdivided into uh, herpes antivirals and other antivirals. When we talk about these medications, the drugs we're talking about are acyclovir, valcyclovir, pamcyclovir, et cetera. And these work by suppressing the synthesis of the virus's DNA. 
What are these used for? These are used for the herpes viruses, and they're also used uh, for, uh, we're going to talk separately about how it's also used for influenza. The adverse effects here are GI effects. Now, these medications, especially when it comes to herpes simplex virus shingles, are most effective when used for within 72 hours of symptom onset. This does not cure herpes. However, it does treat the symptom. Very clear to know that we do not have a drug that cures you of herpes, but we do have one that can manage the outbreaks that can develop from it. Another antiviral that's sometimes considered in a separate class is oseltamivir or Tamiflu. This medication is available for influenza. And again, influenza is a virus, just like COVID is a virus and hep B is a virus and HIV is a virus. These are all viruses. Oseltamivir is only effective if taken within 48 hours of symptom onset. After that, it's generally not in the guidelines to be used it. Just like with herpes, with the acyclovir, it's generally within 72 hours. After that, it's not considered effective. However, when we're giving it for something like shingles, and this applies to acyclovir or valcyclovir, when we're giving it for something like shingles, we only recommend it within 72 hours of symptom onset. But if they've had new eruptions, we call it, within the last 72 hours that this medication is recommended. That's probably a little bit beyond what you need to know at the RN level, but that's good to know for patient education because you are going to see patients with this. And usually you're going to have to educate them on the signs and symptoms, and you're going to have to educate them. Make sure you come to a doctor as soon as your symptoms start. This is not something where you want to suck it up for as long as possible because then you're not going to have a medication to treat it. The next antiviral we have are the interferons. Now we covered interferons a little bit when we talked about multiple sclerosis, if you watch the neurology lecture. That was interferon beta. This is interferon alpha. So this medication is used for hepatitis B virus. It's also used for certain cancers. The adverse effects of this medication are flu-like symptoms, and a large percentage of patients that take this medication are going to get those flu-like symptoms. That's definitely fair game um, for what you would expect. And it's so common to the point that oftentimes it's recommended to just go ahead and give them ibuprofen or something like that before we even give them the medication to address the symptoms that we know are coming. These medications do have a black box warning that because they're so powerful, they can cause or exacerbate many other conditions that we're not going to go into those more specifically. This medication is parenterally only. It's not used for PO. Next bunch of medications we're going to talk about are medications to treat HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. So the first drug class we have are NRTIs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Some of the drugs here are TDF or ZDV. Tenefavir is a relatively well-known one. The mechanism of action here is that it suppresses the synthesis, the creation of the virus's DNA. What is this used for? It's used for HIV. It's also used for HBV. Now, these drugs do have a black box warning for lactic acidosis and hepatotoxicity. Make sure you know that. And ZDV specifically also has additional black box warnings that it can cause myopathy and bone marrow suppression. These medications have many adverse effects, including dermatological, hematologic, cardiac, and metabolic. At this point, just go, just know that this medication has a whole bunch of side effects. You can't possibly um, memorize all of them. Next, we have NNRTIs, and one of the drugs we're going to talk about here is EFV, efeverens. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. The mechanism of action, again, is it suppresses the replication of viral DNA. So we saw one that suppresses synthesis and one that suppresses replication. These are very similar, but not the same thing. This is important to point out because in a minute, we're going to talk about how these medications are almost always used, not almost, are always used in combination. We never give a patient just one of these to treat HIV. It's always going to be multiple medications to treat HIV. Adverse effects of these drugs, again, a lot of them and very severe CNS, dermatolog dermatological hepatotoxicity. Um, EFV specifically cannot be used in pregnancy, as opposed to most of these others that can be used in pregnancy and should be used in pregnancy, but patient has HIV and becomes pregnant, we still need to maintain their HIV treatment. This one cannot be used in pregnancy. Patient education here, and this is the only one we have, patient education we have for any of these specific HIV medications, is you should take it at bedtime and you should take it on an empty stomach. I would recommend that when you take it at bedtime, that is going to decrease some of the CNS symptoms that we mentioned that it causes. PIs or protease inhibitors is another part, another leg in the stool of treatment for HIV. And this prevents the HIV cells from maturing 
adverse effects of this drug, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, bone loss, and more. When it comes to the HIV medications, generally speaking at the RN level, you're not gonna get too deep into these. No drug classes, no the specific patient education points, especially what we're gonna talk about in just a minute when we wrap up HIV, but getting really into the mechanism of action of each of these medications, I would say is probably beyond the RN level. Next, we have integrase strand transfer inhibitors. And this medication, again, takes another approach at addressing HIV. I'm gonna skip the last drug and go to the antiretroviral therapy notes, and then we'll come back. These patient education points, these are all definitely something I would expect you to get tested on, so make sure you know it. Most patients, in fact, I believe it's all patients that have HIV are taking a combination of multiple different drugs. For example, they may be on two NRTIs and one PI or some combination thereof. Um, so yes, you need to educate your patient that yes, you need all of these medications because we want to make sure we're um, correctly treating your HIV. It is critically important that patients take their medication on time without missing a single dose. This is often one of the biggest things that you're gonna be educating your patient who's newly diagnosed with HIV is about making sure they never miss a dose. If a patient misses anything more than just a few doses, literally throughout their life, they can end up becoming, their infection becoming resistant to this medication. I think the number is we wanna maintain a greater than 95% um, compliance rate, because if we get below that, the patient can become resistant. So they need to be taking 95 out of 100 doses correctly on time. That's at a minimum. We wanna go for 100 to make sure that their disease does not become resistant because if it becomes resistant to the medications that we have for HIV, then they're out of luck. So you need to educate your patient. There's apps that are designed for it. There's group supports. There's so much out there, but it's your job as a nurse or a nurse practitioner to educate your patients and make sure they're set up for success. Next, we do have two labs that you may see on a test as how we assess for the efficacy of treatment with their HIV medications. And that is the HIV RNA, also known as viral load and the CD4 T cell count. I wanna be clear, because if your test is a little bit harder, it takes it a step further, that HIV RNA, you would want that to be low or zero. You want their viral load to be down. Their CD4 T cell count, that you want to be up. So what is a low CD4 T cell count? Well, that would show ineffectiveness of HIV therapy. A high CD4 T cell count or a low viral load would show positive response to therapy. There's a term we use here, antiretroviral therapy. That's just a name for all of the drugs that treat HIV, okay? Just like we have chemotherapy is a name for drugs that treat cancer. Antiretroviral therapy is a name for drugs that treat HIV. Antiretroviral therapy or ART therapy is going to be lifelong, okay? So you need to educate your patients on that, that yes, we can treat your disease. Yes, you can actually have the same quality of life and almost the same life expectancy but you have to make sure you're managing your disease correctly. Healthcare workers, which I assume you are if you're watching this video, may be required at some point in your career to take a prophylactic course of one or more of these medications due to exposure to HIV. Now, I wanna go back to what I skipped. The drug here that we're going back to is a combination drug of tenefovir and emtricitabine, and these are sold under the brand name Truvada and Discovi. I would assume you've heard of them. These are a combination drug and they're sold under the concept of PrEP. We talked a few times about patients or healthcare providers that are exposed to a medication and they are exposed to a disease and they take a medication prophylactically. That's called post-exposure prophylaxis. In this case, we are pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're taking this drug or we're telling our patients to take this drug before they were ever even exposed to HIV. And this is meant to reduce their chance of contracting or catching HIV in the first place. The adverse effects of this drug is decreased bone mass and kidney injury. Do know that this does require um, a patient to get routinely tested for HIV while they're on this. Why? Because these two medications are both used to treat HIV, but they can't be used by themselves. They need to be used in combination with another drug. So if I had a patient just on these two and they are not taking it for PrEP, they actually became HIV positive and now they're sort of half treating with taking these two medications for HIV, but they're missing the additional medications that need to be used to treat HIV. It's kind of like they're missing doses and we already know that's gonna make their disease resistant to future treatment. For that reason, 
these two medications are used for PrEP, but we do constantly test the patient for HIV. I think the guidelines are every three months so that if they ever do become positive, we can immediately uh, refer them to the specialist for starters, but we can get them started on the full spectrum of the combination drugs that they do need to treat their HIV. This medication has a black box warning that it can make your HBV worse. If you recognize from earlier that this is sometimes used to treat hepatitis B. Now that we've finished all the different viruses that we were gonna talk about, now let's move on to antihelmintics, which is medications for worms. The drug that we have here is ivermectin. And what is this used for? It's used primarily for worms. Mabendazole is also another drug that's used for worms. I don't really know how much more you would be expected to know in terms of details about these two medications. They're both antihelmintics, which means that they treat worms. Ivermectin, Mabendazole, I wouldn't have expect you to have to know much more than that, certainly not at the RM level. The next medication that we have is an anti-malarial. That's the drug class. The drug name is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. These take multiple actions against malaria. Now, I want to be clear on the indication, the next line, because these are used for both treatment and prevention of malaria. So they're used prophylactically and if actually infected. They do have a number of adverse effects. I would know these. It causes cardiac effects, dermatologic effects, and EPS. That's extra pyramidal symptoms. We talked about this in more detail in the mental health uh, pharmacology lecture. When I say dermatology, I'm referring to the SJS and 10. Those are both dermatological issues. Patient education when taking these medications, avoid excessive sun exposure. So again, test style questions would be, in what uh, patient would it be appropriate to recommend that they wear long sleeves and long pants when going out? things like that, this would be a correct medication. And these medications, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, are the first line treatment for malaria. Next, we're moving on to protozoal infections. So what did we cover? We covered bacteria, we covered viruses, we covered fungi, and now we're covering, covering and we covered worms, helminths, now we're covering protozoa. Protozoa, we have one medication we want to talk about, that's metronidazole. Metronidazole, the brand name is Flagyl. This medication works by impairing DNA function, but it's interesting because this is the only medication we're going to talk about that treats both bacteria and protozoa. We didn't say any other medication that works for two different types of pathogens. This one does. So what is it used for? It's used for certain severe bacterial infections, and then it's also used for protozoal infections like trichomoniasis. It does have many other off-label uses. The adverse effects are dermatological and blood disorders. Um, this medication has an additional patient teaching point. They must stay away from alcohol because when mixed with alcohol, it can have what's called a disulfram-like effect, which means when those two medications come together, metronidazole and ethyl alcohol, the patient may develop some severe unpleasant symptoms. Next, we have anti-infectives, and this is something I assume you're all familiar with, something like bacitracin, which is a topical ointment, and it's given to impair bacterial cell wall synthesis, AKA prevent the patient from getting a bacterial infection. How do you do this? You would educate your patient, put it on the wound, the cut, the scrape, whatever it is, up to three times daily. And this is given, this medication is also available ophthalmically and systemically, and we're not discussing those for right now. The last drug we're gonna talk about are ridiculicides. Two medications are permethrin and pyrethrin, also known as Nix and RID and these are meant to kill lice or scabies. When these medications are used for scabies, you should educate your patient to cover their entire skin, their entire body, other than mucous membranes, their entire body and leave it there for eight to 14 hours, so overnight, and then you can wash it off. When it's used for lice, in that case, we tell the patient, wash your hair, put the product in, leave it in for a good 10 minutes, and then remove the nits with the nit comb that generally comes with this medication. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.